Assalamu alaikum. Uh, this is Najiba Saeed. I'm so uh, happy to join all of you. I was uh, with you in the Islamic Center during the month of Ramadan for a couple of nights. So today um, I wanted to address uh, some of the topics around the notion of uh, justice, peace building, and um, the example of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in particular today, um, we have three weeks together. This, uh, this, <laughs> this, is, this is sort of uh, a series. Uh, I've done them before um, here, at, um, here with the Islamic Center. And so this particular series is, um, is going to be around the notion particularly of Prophet Muhammad. And I also wanted to take into account everything that is happening around us, uh, both the COVID virus as well as anti-Black racism and the reality of police violence that our nation is facing. Um, so uh, initially when I was asked to do this, I put together these topics a while back, but they've continued to be um, essentially I think very relevant for what is happening um, in our world today. And one of the things that's important to establish for those of you who may be Muslim that are listening and for those of you who are not Muslim to understand that the spiritual authority of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, by that I mean his example, uh, Professor um, Amr Abdullah talks about, he's a professor of conflict resolution and he talks about one of the things that is beautiful about the conflict resolution model of Muslims is that it is really based on the model of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he talks about the way that we teach peace has to be not just reading about Prophet Muhammad, not just understanding the seerah or the life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but it is a process, his pedagogy or his teaching method, uh, Dr. Abdullah says, is we need to work on embodying that. So when we read about a practice of peace building, you know, I often say that the word peace is the most abstract concept in, um, in, in our culture. We use the word peace, we use the word justice, but what does it actually mean when we practice it in the world? And Amr Abdullah says that um, when we study the example of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that we can understand it intellectually, we can understand it from our minds as a story, but that the story has to take on significance of behavior. And so here today, I wanna to make sure people understand I'm not giving a lesson in fiqh or jurisprudence. For that, you can listen to other scholars who spend their time telling you what is um, permissible or impermissible in a situation. This is really um, much more focused on learning from the stories of Rasulullah learning from lessons from the Quran, that we can apply in our life to talk and engage and deal with issues of conflict, deal with issues of resolution, deal with issues of uh, justice in our lives. So I just wanted to make sure that when we approach this topic, you understand what I'm bringing to the table and what um, I'm hoping we discuss. Because uh, one of the things that I've been doing in the last 20 years is intervening in real life conflicts going into situations where violence has happened around the world and being asked to develop a model of resolution. And that model is always a practical embedded embodied model that deals with real people, real life uh, and real situations. So what I have done in that work is particularly when I'm dealing with uh, Muslim communities is to ground the work that I do in partnership with communities in the example of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because as uh, Dr. Amr Abdullah, as I mentioned, he indicates that when we are able to speak from that uh, example, when we are able to glean the lessons from those stories, then it is much more relevant to our communities. Um, and it means something. It carries with it not just weight of uh, authority, but actually it carries with it the connection of the emotional connection, the spiritual connection that all of us um, who are Muslim have for Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So today um, I really wanted to talk about this idea of not peacemaking but peace building. And I think that's a really important distinction. We saw this distinction emerge uh, more than 20 years ago in the field. So it used to be that we thought of this idea of peacemaking as someone or an individual or a community or a person or 
a, a nation going in and peacemaking between conflicting parties. And what that meant is it was just looking for a cessation of violence, the ending of violence. And this notion of peace building began to say, wait, what happens when there is violence that re-emerges, violence that comes up again? Or as we are looking at the situation today in this country, what happens when there is racism and as John Galton would say, structural violence embedded in the way that a country has functioned for a long time, where racism, particularly anti-Black racism, is embedded in the way that structures function. And I think that's a really important question because peace building says, well, we don't want to just come here and look for an absence of violence. We don't wanna just come in here and cease violence. We wanna to go to the causes of that violence. We want to actually build structures in the society that are an alternative to the structures that have promoted violence. So I just wanted to have us think through Prophet Muhammad, not just as someone who went in and stopped violence, but looked at the social causes, the root causes, the, the deeply embedded causes of violence. And particularly, one thing I often talk about is there's this myth of interpersonal peacemaking, that all problems can be solved if just you and I get along. And I think that's a great way to start. That's relational peacemaking. That's doing peacemaking between people, which is absolutely important. There are many programs around the world that focus on interpersonal peacemaking. But what we found from the research is if you go into a conflict where there is major imbalance of power, whether the power is economic, whether the power is um, from having um, control over uh, uh, natural resources, whether the power is a historical oppression of a particular community, that you can't go in and just say, you know what, this is about us getting along with one another. This is about us just getting to understand one another because that in some ways is, is problematic. It actually erases those history. It erases the structural violence that Galton talks about in his work, this idea that structures that are in place in society can actually promote violence. So um, I think it's important to kind of dispel, first of all, the notion of just peacemaking as the only way to deal or engage with violence and to think about this model sustainable over time of peace building, of cultural change and cultural shift um, and recreating institutions that themselves do not, um, do not promote violence. And secondly, to think about interpersonal peacemaking as a wonderful foundation and a tool, but that it's not the end all and the be all of, of, of dealing with issues around violence. So those are a couple of kind of concepts I wanna introduce in the beginning as we go forward. And the last one in terms of my research in peacemaking and peace building is this idea from Elise Boulding on cultures of violence and cultures of peace. So um, in my work, I often say, you know, any uh, particular group, community, religion has the capacity for peace and has the capacity for violence. And that really where we are um, in this time and age is not a conflict between um, is really not a conflict often in the interreligious setting between communities of faith only, but it's between this idea of what as a society are we interested in creating a culture of violence where, um, where institutions and structures in that society, not um, they promote violence, they permit violence, they allow for violence. And maybe we live in a time even where violence is rewarded, where um, violence is seen as the way to resolve conflicts where um, using methods of uh, using methods um, of dealing with of conflicts that violence is imposed as the first resolution that violence is imposed as the first intervention and so Elise Boulding would say that those are cultures of violence and um, the alternative in her model is cultures of peace. And cultures of peace, Bolding says, are cultures in which disagreement is valued, difference is valued, where um, when you engage with conflict issues, you allow for the capacity of people's 
um, differing histories, identities, and stories to be at the table. Uh, a culture of violence often will erase dissenting stories, erase dissenting opinions, and, and reward authoritarian um, behavior, reward the idea of strength in ways that uh, people who are at the margins are not just pushed out, but often, um, but often not even included in the narrative around, what, around the community and its story. So this culture of violence and culture of peace, I think is really relevant when we look at Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Muhammad and the society into which he was born. It was a society that by many descriptions is one that looked to a culture of violence. Um, a society where another um, factor of cultures of violence is there's often a major inequality. As I mentioned before, um, violence is not just um, violence is not just what you see when someone is physically hurting someone, but the structures of a society, whether it's institutional or systemic racism, that is actually a form of violence. I often, with my students, I talk to them about. Um, the hundreds of people that every year die in the streets of Los Angeles because they're unsheltered. And that is a form of structural violence. There isn't someone out there physically necessarily uh, causing violence to individuals who live without shelter. But what they are actually doing is the society in terms of economic inequality, structural racism, school to prison pipeline, um, many, other, um, many other systems that have been established that are not inclusive, those systems push people out. And a violence, meaning we have something like three to 500 people a year that die in the streets of Los Angeles, that is a form of violence. And we have to begin to be able to have conversations around structural violence. And particularly, I think in this time, it's connection to structural racism. So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes into a society where there is hierarchy, where wealth is distributed very unevenly, where um, you have a particular status, whether it's your family status, your vocational status, um, you come into a time where one tribe or one community is elevated over another. There were many systems that establish a form of structural violence that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came into. So what is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's message? What is the message that he brings? So the Quran tells us that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a rahmah, is a mercy, is, um, and many of you have heard me in my talks, not just a mercy in such a way that he is kind, but his presence, his message, his mission, is one that exhibits a form of compassion. And that compassion is such a rich compassion. That compassion that Rasulullah embodies is one in many ways that we see as an establishment of a culture of peace. So it's not just his individual message, but his intuition, his interest, his development, his spiritual care and development of his Sahaba and ultimately in the city of Medina, a culture of peace in which those that are um, formerly were at the margin of society in Mecca, those that were cast out, those that were not uh, a part of decision making become central to the formation of the society in Medina. And that is an incredible transformation of society just, and what's profound about it as Amr Abdullah says in his work is that this is not a mission that he had 70 years for, 80 years for. This is a mission that was less than 30 years long. So to be able to achieve a shift, a shift in the status quo. In conflict resolution, we say the most difficult power to deal with when you're trying to engage in social change is the notion of the power of status quo. I can imagine many of you have dealt with that where you go into a school or a community or a masjid and you say, well, why, uh, why is this community excluded? Why are these people not on the board? Why is this not allowed to happen? And people say, you know why? Because it's always been done this way. So, 
that's the answer. People don't know why, but the answer is because it's always been done this way. And that is the most difficult kind of conventional wisdom to change. And in fact, the Quran tells us sometimes when people would be asked, why do you believe such a thing? Why do you hold on to this belief? They will say, because those, because those that came, who came before us, this is what we were told. So it's that status quo um, that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came into. And you know, through his mission, he was in fact, often um, we know he was approached to say, listen, listen, just stop preaching your message of equality. We will give you what you want. We will buy you off. We will give you everything you need. Just be silent on this. Just hold back this message of equality. Hold back this message of justice. Hold back this message of, of, uh, of going forward with a society that engages and um, includes um, all of the different elements uh, that are present in our community. And Rasulullah refused, we know, he refused that early in his mission. And not only did he refuse, but we know that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, part of his example of being uh, someone who built peace, who put his life on the line for um, an inclusive formation of justice, that he was actually banned. We know that the <laughs> original Muslim ban was during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, where he was banned um, from, uh, and this was a ban that was an economic ban. It was a familial ban. It was a ban that caused, as we know, um, so much pain for him and his family. And in fact, led, um, led him and uh, he had to deal in that time with the year of sorrow. That one of the years of his mission was a year of sorrow. Because you know what's most difficult, and the Quran tells us when we stand up for justice, sometimes we have to stand up against our own family. So Rasulullah is standing up for justice, standing up for engaging practices that are inclusive and, um, and, and ending practices that were violent against individuals and communities and classes of his society. So standing up for that, especially when you have to stand up for those that are close to you when and sorry when you have to stand up against those that are close to you it's easy to go somewhere where you don't know people where they're not close to you where you don't really have anything to lose you know and you go in and you fight for a particular issue but imagine having to stand up against your own your own people and i think that is one of the risks that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam um embodies in this notion of peace building and moving in uh, another lecture, we'll talk about the formation of healing justice, is that he literally put his life on the line for that risk. He was banned. He had to deal with, um, he had to deal with the death of his allies, of his closest, of his closest um, source of comfort, his wife. And it's, it's something to think about when you are looking at how people are standing up for justice today, the costs can be tremendous. The costs can be incredibly difficult, that these are not easy things to stand up for and that the example of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not to take the easy path of being bought out, not to take the easy path of saying, you know what, you are my relative, you are my, I, I come from a favored tribe. I don't need to speak up. I have power, why should I speak up? My vocation of caravan and trade is something that is well established in this tribal hierarchy. But no, he, he risked all of that and he continued to stand up. So I think one of the things we learn about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that compassion that he had was not conditional. That compassion that he had for people wasn't one. Sorry, thinking about him is... Um, it should bring tears to all of us, inshallah, but thinking about his example and what he risked. Um, so his compassion was not conditional. It wasn't a compassion that said, you know, I'm going to just um, stand up when I benefit, or I'm going to stand up when my kin and my community or those that are of the same racial background, when they will benefit. He risked all of that. And so when we live in a time of 
racism. It means that we have to be able to exemplify the message of Islam, but also to be able to stand up for justice and take the risks that Rasulullah took in terms of potentially losing, he lost privileges. <laughs> he lost privileges in his society. He lost the privilege, his economic privileges. He lost his social privileges. He lost his tribal privileges. And this was all for the reason that justice is something he was trying to establish as his mission to be a source of compassion for all. And that's another beautiful thing that the Quran tells us, the source of compassion was not exclusive to Muslims, was not exclusive to his tribal identity, was not exclusive to his racial or ethnic identity. It is a source of compassion for all. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the things that uh, is in addition to this notion of Rahmah was this idea of his being an interrupter he interrupted systems that were not compassionate. He interrupted systems of hierarchy. Particularly, he interrupted actually economic systems that were based on cruelty. And that's why the people that were attracted to the message of Islam, the first uh, shuhada, the first people who lost their lives for the sake of Islam, not the ones that went, um, not the ones that actually were in a form of battle, but the ones that lost their lives because they were slaves, the ones that lost their lives because they stood up for the religion of Islam, not because they stood up for it alone, but because they also embedded in that standing up was a notion that we will not take oppression as this social order has established. So they were disruptors. They interrupted and disrupted a system of deep oppression at that time. And in fact, this is not only exclusive to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that it was women, that it was young people. Some of the earliest Sahaba, the earliest companions of Prophet Muhammad uh, Ali Radiallahu Anhu, they were young, very young, very young people. They were, um, as we talked about, they were enslaved people who had, when they stood up, the risks that they took, like uh, like Bilal radiallahu anhu, the, biz, the risks that they took were tremendous. And I think that's something we need to remember uh, very often when we learn about the Sahaba, particularly in the early times, we don't think about the risks that they took, not because they were out themselves forming violence, but actually they were embodying this notion of peace building because they took um, through nonviolent action, through standing up for justice, they took a tremendous amount of risk and they, this was a form of protest actually. It was a form of protest. So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was an interrupter of systems um, that were not compassionate at that time. Systems that hoarded money. We hear again and again in the Quran, it's not just charity and we have so many categories of who to give charity to. Um, but also it was the hoarding of money, the keeping of money, the keeping of power within, within the hands of a few. That was one of the things that he interrupted as well. So we see the people that were attracted to the message and the mission of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam early on. I talked about some of those people. Think about the beginning of the mission of Jesus, Isa Alayhi Salam. That was another, um, another prophet that attracted those that were at the very margins of society, those that, um, and the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who tells us that there is no veil between the prayer of the oppressed and Allah. There is a closeness, there is a connection, there is a sacred connection between those that are dealing with oppression. And as we know that the best form of jihad, the best form of exertion is to speak a word of truth to a tyrant or an oppressor. So actually <laughs> this peace building, truth telling prote protest that our prophet embodied um, is, is one that uh, I think about so often, not just in these times, but in all times, what are we willing to risk um, to stand up for justice and not the justice that serves me, but the justice that serves all, the justice that serves the communities or individuals that if I stand up for them, I don't gain any power. I don't gain any status. Um, but you know, what's interesting is that that's thinking of it in a worldly way.
that's thinking of it in a dunya in a way that is where where benefit is seen as now if we look at the hadith that there is no veil between the prayer of the oppressed then we know that this standing up is not an act of charity it's not an act of pity but the standing up for justice and standing with people and being uh, an helpful ally is actually, um, it's a sacred act. It doesn't diminish us in status. It may in some places people will speak of you, but it doesn't diminish us in the eyes of Allah and in um, the, the legacy of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because he did that on such, um, on, on such a repeated basis. Um, and we'll go into some of those examples inshallah in the future. But this idea of him as an interrupter of systems of really all prophets coming with a message saying that the practices of society right now are harmful, are damaging, are problematic, are exclusive, um, resources are not being shared, um, power is in the hands of a few. So Rasulullah this is one of the beautiful parts of his example and his message. You know, and it's it's really interesting because I wanted to talk a little bit also today about the idea of justice. Scholars now um, talk about outcome justice and also procedural justice. Procedural justice is how decisions are made in a society and are is the process. Here we're not talking about the product, but is the process inclusive? So, for instance, right now, if you look at the criminal justice system in the United States, the process itself is we know that the number of particularly um, black men and women that are incarcerated, that are subjected to police violence is disproportionate to the population of those that are uh, present in society. So the procedures themselves um, are producing results that are not just, but what we have to look like, it, what we have to look at is not just the outcome, but the procedures. Are, are the procedures ones that are, um, that are inclusive, as we talked about earlier, embody compassion? And it's really um, fascinating because there's a story uh, during the time of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that really talks to procedural justice. So it wasn't about an outcome, but uh, women um, came to him and said, we don't feel like we're heard. We don't feel like we're a part of the conversation and conversation with the prophet at his time wasn't just conversation. It was conversation with the leader of a, of a, of a, whole, um, of a whole community. So what Rasulullah did is instead of saying, you know what, I'm right, I'm listening to you. I know what you're saying. I, you should trust me. I, I hear you. I will, I'm, I'm, I've been chosen by Allah for this mission. So you shouldn't question me. Um, I think you can imagine there might be leaders <laughs> who use their um, connection to spiritual authority to say exactly that, to say, no, 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 you shouldn't question my authority. And not only are they, were, the, were the women at that time asking, they weren't asking about his authority, but they were asking about how he was engaging. Again, this idea of peace building being an embodied communal process. So you can imagine any of us who have some access to power that when we are questioned, what might our response be? No, 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 let me handle it. Why are you out questioning me? Why I'm doing the right thing. You shouldn't correct me. You shouldn't come to me and, and bring your uh, issues to me because I'm doing the right thing. And this is really um, something I try to get across to my students is that Leadership is not transactional. Leadership is transformational, that we uh, should be transformed by those that we work with. And in fact, those that we serve, we're servants in this process, servants to those that we lead. And um, you know, I often tell them, if you get to the point where you're surrounded by people who always agree with you as a leader, whatever that may be, maybe in your community, your family, your your block, your company, if everybody agrees with you, then in fact, you are in the most toxic state of leadership because you need to be questioned. You don't want to be made as a leader. You don't want people to make an idol of you where they never question, where they never teach you. 
Imam al Ghazali tells us that learning is a potential in every human and that it's manifested when you engage in the world and actually learn. So any of us has the potential to be a teacher, but we can't be a teacher without being a learner. The learning must come with the teaching. If you reach a state where you feel like you have no more learning to do, that in fact is also a very dangerous state to be in and we should make prayers to Allah that we have humility, that we don't reach a place in our lives where we feel we have nothing to learn. And what that does is it keeps you open to people because you can see anyone in your life as someone who could teach you a lesson, anyone who is coming and walking into your life. Um, so as the women came to Rasulullah and asked and said, we don't have, um, we don't feel we have enough engagement. In fact, what he did is then reserve a time just for them, reserve a time to engage them. So instead of shutting down their complaint around procedural justice. So here it's not the outcome. It's not saying that we feel that there's a decision that's been made that's negative against us, but we feel the way you're making decisions needs to include us more. And the profound response isn't to shut it down, but to say, you know what? Let me find a way to include you more. Let me build a procedural justice system, the procedures of how we function and how I as a leader get feedback. Let me actually build one that is more inclusive. So I really want us to pay attention to this notion of procedural justice when we look at the seerah or the, the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi it's not justice just from the perspective of the outcome is equal for everyone, but it's even how you make a decision. And he does this again and again through his lifetime as a prophet, Muhammad, as, as prophet, as a prophet, demonstrating that we have to be in the process of making decisions aware of the voices that are not a part of that process. Sometimes when uh, my students say, uh, I'm bringing people to the table and I ask them, where are the empty chairs? Where are the empty chairs? Who are you not listening to? Who have you not lo looked at? Who have you not thought about? And sometimes because our vision is so narrow, we don't even know what we don't know. And that's why it takes humility to be able to say, you know what? Maybe the table we created, maybe the board we created, maybe the organization that we created, it really is not including the voices of the people we're trying to serve. It's not including the voices of the people who are directly impacted by this issue. It's not including the community that, sh that, is, um, that is the one that gives us the most wisdom. I tell people when I do mediation and when I open up any mediation process, conflict resolution process, I always say the people closest to the conflict are the experts. The people who are closest to the conflict itself are the experts. So it's not really me that's the expert. If I'm coming in to help in a resolution process, I'm not the expert. The people who are dealing with the conflict are the expert. All that we do, when we come in to intervene in such a conflict is to give a space for that conversation. So I think we have to really think through these notions. Um, first of all, this notion of Rahmah, of Prophet Muhammad's mission beyond the very kind of, I think it's a rather tepid or, um, I don't know, it's not a very dynamic translation of the word Rahmah. This idea of Rahmah, of a radical, inclusive compassion and compassion not as just a belief, compassion not just as an abstract feeling, like I feel compassionate, but compassion as a practice, compassion as a daily form of how we are in the world and how the systems that we engage in, the criminal justice system, the economic justice system, the environmental justice system, the, all of the many systems, the school systems, um, are they embodying a form of radical and inclusive compassion? And by radical, I mean one that is a practice in which we um, in which we think about inclusion beyond that diversity, that cosmetic diversity that we have people um, people of 
you know, just people who are uh, representatives, but are those systems actually, are they benefiting only certain communities? Are they serving in ways that are functionally racist, functionally exclusive? Because sometimes um, you can use beautiful words to describe something, but you have to look at the actual function of a system and who it impacts. So this idea of compassion, this notion that the mission of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions was not one that sought to, to keep the status quo of power imbalances, of inequity, but it was actually um, the reason in many ways his message was a threat was that it felt like a reordering of the social classes at that time, of the ways that people utilize cruelty to close systems to the wider um, society. And to think of the examples of his uh, companions who um, embodied in themselves this notion of, of um, standing for peace and justice. And that particularly with Rasulullah that it's not about justice that only serves you when you want it. It's a moral imperative that when anyone is being excluded, that that is a stance that Muslims take, not just because it's in, in injustice or it's unjust for a particular group, but that in and of itself, injustice is problematic, that injustice is something that is morally reprehensible to Muslims, um, whomever it is. Um, it is affecting. And I think that that is a really important thing because then it makes us check ourselves and check our communities and our institutions. This is not only an outwardly looking um, established process as we talked about in the time of Rasulullah how we are making decisions in our own institutions. We can't go out and seek justice and march for justice. And then our own institutions are exemplifying racism exemplifying um, all of these things that we have talked about as problematic. The culture of peace, the culture of rahma and compassion has to be start from our homes and it has to start. And I think um, particularly Muslim children are deeply affected if they see the institutions that are serving their community and regularly, regularly functioning in unjust ways, whether procedurally or outcome wise, and then they, they, they see that, a child sees that. So we have to really think about, are we modeling as, as Amr Abdullah says in his work, Islam is a religion of modeling. Prophet Muhammad models for us the practice, as he says, as he says in the practice of restoring Islam to its message of justice and equality. So Prophet Muhammad is that example that does that for us. And our, and as, as older people, our children see what we do. We can say the most beautiful things, but it's how they see the religion portrayed, not in the media, but how they see it functional also in their everyday life. And that um, this notion of inclusive community and, um, and practice of rahmah and compassion is a lifelong learning process and that it is a personal process. It is a process that each of us comes to with different resources, different understandings, but that it is never too late to think through how can I improve myself? How can I move forward and think through becoming an agent so that when I move in the world, I produce a sense of justice and equality. I become an example of that, not because I'm trying to prove to other people, but because I believe myself that part of the deep held notion of trying to of trying to imitate the prophet in his example is that justice is something that is embedded in our religious tradition and that peace is found not through the process of shutting down dissent of building systems of cruelty that um, are exclusive, but in fact, in our tradition, in the stories that we told, we do, that we are told about our prophet, that we don't give up that mission when someone tries to buy us off. We don't give up that mission when it doesn't benefit me or my family alone, that these are times, and they have always been times throughout history, 
where Muslims are called to sacrifice, to stand up for justice, to know that there may be losses that we will have to deal with that there might be times that we will have to deal with the reality of losing favor, losing power, but ultimately the power remains with Allah. And if that is what we are seeking, then this is not a question for us. This is an imperative for us. Shukran jazakum Allah, and I will end here. Thank you so much.